Okay, hi, good morning, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Inas. I'm um, yeah one of the founders of Tomorrow, and um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm a huge, passionate uh, product person, um, and I also brought um, a small presentation with me that I will try to share now. And uh, since we all have spent a lot of time on Zoom in the last um, two years, um, that should work, hopefully without any uh, problems here. So, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So that's that's looking that's looking good. So from my heart, I'm really yeah. I would call myself a social entrepreneur or impact entrepreneur and a really passionate product person. And um, today I want to talk about tech for good and um, how we can use tech to scale impact for a better future and why we need to do that. And if I look a little bit back at my background, so um, I started my, my first company right out of university. I studied uh, corporate management economics and also management information systems. And um, I founded a, a cloud software company um, that helped big food companies such as Unilever, Aldi, Metro, basically trace back their products, um, their food products um, through the whole supply chain to where they were originally produced and planted Yeah, to really show, you know, where does the product come from? How was it treated? How was it grown? And um, I grew up this company really in a very, very organic way, yeah, um, because I think when I started back then, you know, the whole venture capital landscape, especially in Germany, was still very, very, very small, and it was really more organic growth that we did, yeah, um, after 10, um, approximately 10 years, I think we had a, a team of roughly above 100 people, and um, we uh, were like, I would call, like a hidden champion in the field of um supply chain transparency software and then came the time when when i really thought do i want to do that the next 10 years of my of my life because it was basically my first job and increasingly i i felt that i wanted to do something more yeah i wanted to create some positive impact in the world and i had the feeling that with products you can do so great things and you can scale things and i saw so many other companies out there you know scaling like crazy and i was thinking why can't i as a product person you know use product and accelerate positive impact and so this thought didn't didn't stop and and one day i said okay now um, basically i have to take the consequence and drop out of my own company that i actually founded and a lot of people told me, Inas, you're totally crazy. Why would you Why would you leave a good running company? You know, you have a relaxed job. The product is working. But yeah, I, I couldn't hold it anymore. And, and I jumped again completely into cold water and, and started again something from, from scratch, which is now tomorrow. And I'm going to talk about tomorrow a little bit more. But before I dive in, I want to maybe go one step back. Because when I started to found out my second company you know the biggest narrative for founders out there yeah was the so-called unicorns everybody wanted to create a unicorn yeah for those of you um who who don't know what a unicorn is in the context of tech it's basically basically um a company that has a valuation yeah of more than one billion us dollar on the private markets, meaning it hasn't gone to the stock market yet, yeah, but it's valued at um, one billion um, US uh, dollars by by investors. But that's the only criteria. So once you reach that, you are a unicorn. Okay. So in the past, Facebook, for example, was a traditional unicorn before they went IPO. Uber, Airbnb, Amazon, you know, was also one of those role role models, and. If you look at the, you know, especially the last 10 years, uh, um, the number of unicorns that were created year by year was constantly increasing. And primarily, you find though that those companies are tech companies because technology and uh, products, you know, now enable those, those unicorns to scale at mind-blowing speeds. But... 
you know, if you look at, you know, some people like Mark Zuckerberg, at least when, when I found it um, um, tomorrow, you know, a lot of people, you know, were trying to follow, uh, you know, the path of, of Mark Zuckerberg, for example. And, you know, one of his statements that, um, that really shocked me was, move fast and break things. Unless you're breaking stuff, you're not moving fast enough. And I think <laughs> this very much uh, shows this narrative of, of a unicorn. So you need to grow at any cost, even if you break things. And if we look at the big unicorns, I think apart from really creating big wealth um, for you know, a lot of uh, investors, there is not really much positive impact that those companies really, really have created. And what's also, I think, interesting, all these companies that were created by founders, right? And if you look at founders, founders typically love to solve problems, or at least I love to solve problems, right? That's exciting. And as a product UX and engineering people, I think all of you, you also love to solve problems. And if we look around, I think we can also clearly see that we have a lot of problems out there. And I think one of the biggest problems that we, when we look out there, is really our climate crisis. And this is a screenshot that I have taken yesterday. I don't know how many of you know this kind of visualization. It's um, a countdown, countdown timer about how much time is actually left for us until we have basically depleted our CO2 budget to reach the 1.5 degree goal. And it's really shocking to see that now we have less than seven years left. That means we have seven years to really radically change our economy, our businesses, in order to turn around and not have a total destructive climate crisis. And, you know, I, I watch this very, very regularly and, and see and look at this, and we can really see that the time is very, very limited. And from a scientific uh, perspective, you know, we are at this very um, 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 point here that you see at the peak. And the gray dotted line shows the current path yeah, where global warming, you know, is about to reach, you know, three degrees um, if we don't do anything. And basically what we have to do, we have to take down this curve and really radically um, decrease our carbon emissions and really um, remove um, carbon from our atmosphere. And if we talk about climate, I think it's very, very important to say that it's not purely climate for the sake of climate, but I think since Friday um, for Futures went basically on the streets, you know, they were primarily campaigning for climate justice because there are a lot of social aspects also associated to the climate crisis because basically the climate affects you know, they not only harm us in the West as the main producers of CO2 emissions, but they, they harm increasingly and mainly, I think, some disprivileged regions in the world, you know, who are not, who haven't even been part of uh, creating those emissions at scale. So when you talk about climate, it's always also about climate justice. And that's why we believe if, you know, we're able, um, let's say, to solve the climate catastrophe, it also has, um, you know, a social or a positive um, social aspect. And we have seen it, right? We don't have time. And that's why we need impact at scale. And we need that now. And so, when we started tomorrow at the very beginning, we very quickly said, you know, this, this concept, this role model of a unicorn is totally outdated. We actually need a new kind of role model. And so actually we came up together also with some other people and some other people from, um, you know, um, the sustainable, let's say startup scene with another animal, a zebra, yeah? So why on earth is it a zebra? 
yeah, I think there, there, there are many reasons why a zebra is a really cool new idea. First of all, zebras, in contrast to unicorns, they are real. They really exist, right? Mm. And they're black and white. Yeah, and black and white means they not only, you know, stand for, you know, profitable growth. No, but they also stand for positive impact and doing something good. So they can bring that together, right? Being a profitable company and creating social or environmental impact. Zebras are very, very, very enduring. Yeah, so they're in for the long game. So they're not interested in short, short term, uh, basically profits at any cost. And zebras, very interesting. You cannot ride on a zebra. Unless anyone of you has experiences uh, riding on a zebra, please let me know. Um, but as far as I understood, you cannot ride on a, on a zebra. So they are untamable. So they will stick to their way and they will not be distracted from anyone uh, who tells them what to do. And, you know, zebras, they have been here for, you know, since a very, very, very long time. And they are here on this planet to stay. They are very, very resilient. And I think very, very important aspect of zebras is also that they are herd animals. They do things in a group. They do things together. And I think that's why we're also here today, right? We want to see together what can we achieve together? What can we change together? So please keep that, you know, that new role model in, 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 you know, in your heads, becoming a zebra, yeah, instead of becoming a unicorn. And you don't necessarily need to found a new company to become a zebra. No, you can also transform your existing organization more in a zebra organization. And I think we'll talk more about this, what this actually means. And in order to understand this kind of journey, what makes up a zebra, I will give a perspective out of the founding history, maybe of tomorrow, uh, to give you insights of what I believe makes up a zebra organization. So with tomorrow, basically we do mobile banking, yeah, um, in a sustainable way. And this, this triggered us basically, or me, when I initially found it tomorrow. So where do we stand today? I think we have a really nice product, I would say, that our, our customers really, really love. At least on the App Store and Google Play Store, we're the banking app that has the best app ratings <laughs> of all uh, bank apps in Germany. So I think it really shows that it really resonates with our customers and they really, really love, love the product. We have uh, roughly 125,000 customers. And um, what it is, um, you know, that we do impact-wise, et cetera. Um, yeah, I will give you more insight in, in a moment. But I want, again, I think to, to step uh, uh, one step back and we want to reflect on how do you start this impact journey, okay? And I can tell you maybe at least what what I what I did. Yeah? So first of all, you know, all of us we're 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 active in a certain industry, right? And so if we want to gear, you know, um, our whole economy towards more impact, we need to transform every inch, every every, every small inch of our um, overall economy towards impact. And so it's always go good to look at your industry where does it stand and i did the same for the financial industry yeah because somehow i got hooked with the financial industry and i looked around and you know they say money makes the world go round but i had the feeling that money makes the world really go wrong yeah and and why is that because money fuels the economy right a lot of companies need investment money loans to build new plans to expand their business to grow faster and they need for this money and banks give companies this kind of money so, so there is a huge leverage around money and where do you channel this money and when i looked around so one one really shocking moment uh, was this was a terrible school massacre that happened um in 2018, so very much at the very beginning when we started off uh, tomorrow. 
And the shocking thing about the school massacre that happened at the high school in Florida was that the person, you know, that did that um, school shooting used a rifle that was produced by an arms manufacturer that was being invested in by the school teachers pension fund. Yeah? So the school teachers, you know, every month they put away a certain amount of money for their retirement in a pension fund. And this very much a very pension fund invested part of their money in the gun manufacturer for the gun that was used, you know, in this in the school massacre. It, it just shows this absurdity of, you know, where you channel money, where you not even are aware of that this happens <laughs> through your bank or through investment fund that where you are involved in. And so this was one aspect. And this, the other aspect is, you all remember, right? Um, end of 2015, <clears throat> we had, you know, this Paris Climate Agreement, yeah, that all or most of the nations around the world committed to. We said, we are in a climate crisis. We need to stop climate change. And therefore, many, many countries around the globe committed that we want to stop global warming, ideally at 1.5 degrees, and if not, way below 2 degrees. And everyone said yes. All the political leaders said yes. All the big companies, all the big guys said yes. Yes, we're all in. And all the banks said yes, we're all in. And interestingly, what happened after 2016, this graph shows you basically the big banks yeah, around the globe, the leading banks, the amounts, and the, the, these numbers are billions of dollars that they invested after 2016 in fossil fuels. Yeah, so an increasing amount that was invested every year in, in, in fossil fuels. So this is unbelievable. Yeah, and we said, okay, this cannot happen, right? We need to change this. Yeah, this is crazy. So this is now my perspective on the financial industry, but you can do the same exercise for your industry where you're in, right? And look at what is going on. And now we come to the product side of things, right? <laughs> so this, this first the thing was first about you know the, the 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 negative impact of the financial industry, but banks at the end of the day they also are you know kind of tech companies or at least they used to be real tech companies in the past because everyone who wants to use banking needs to do some online banking or needs to have an app etc. And when we started off tomorrow, those banking apps they were bad. I mean they were really 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 bad yeah and very interesting when you ask millennials yeah seven out of ten millennials said back then they would rather visit their dentist than their local bank yeah so it just shows that that, that the banking relationship also was really really broken you know and they didn't like this kind of um, interaction you know that the um, banks provided also through their existing products so all in all we figured out the banking system is really, really broken, and let's go out and fix it. And how do you fix it, right? So the idea of creating impact, that's great, right? But now how do you get it to the masses? How do you excite people? Yeah? And in German, um, you know, for, for those who are, who are not living in, in, in Germany, I, I always give the example of, um, of the Reform House yeah, in Germany. Reform House is like a very nerdy, um, organic um, convenience store. Yeah, it was one of the first ones out there. They were very expensive. They had a very, very limited product portfolio. And I don't know, it wasn't a great user experience, right? And they never managed to scale um, um, sustainable groceries. Huh? And I think when we when we talk about banking, it was for us the same, because when we looked out at the, at the banking market, there were a lot of companies out there who, or there were a handful of, of companies who tried to do sustainable banking already, but didn't manage to scale it. And then we looked at their products and we said, that's bad UX. And so we said, with great UX yeah, and a great product um, that creates um, impact, you can scale that impact. And that's why we believe the product is so important. And we have that saying within tomorrow that we stick to, to save the world, yeah, 
you have to throw a better party than those destroying it. Yeah? So the product needs to feel better than those other products that are doing harm. And if you're able, you know, to supercharge your product with impact and make it a great experience, then, then you are throwing the better party and then you're geared towards scaling impact. How did we translate that in tomorrow? So first of all, when we started bank cards, they were unbelievably ugly. So we were the first ones to actually design cards in a, in a, in a portrait format. Yeah, Nobody was doing that that days. And so that's the first thing. And a lot of people told us, no, that looks like the old telephone cards, you know, that you had to stick into those old telephone booths. I don't know the, who of you still remember those things. Cannot do that. <clears throat> and you, it's not possible that you don't print the number on the front, right? Um, so we started to experiment with new formats, with nice designs. We tried to bring art into into banking cards, yeah, make them beautiful. And then we also were the first ones to experiment with new materials. We said, why not make a banking card out of wood? Again, everyone told us, you're completely nuts. That will never, never work, yeah. And you cannot imagine how much stress this was to convince people that they would allow us to print, um, you know, a card um, on wood. And at the, at the end, we, we convinced Visa, um, yeah, and they were really a great partner. And we made a pilot over one year and, and showed that it's working. And now I think there are more and more wooden cards out there. It just shows, you know, that you can do some twists that are exciting, yeah, that help you help you scale. And I think about UX for a product like banking, I think it's also important that it's really minimalistic, yeah, that you can open an account within a a few minutes, even Sunday afternoon from your sofa. And that's really what we did, yeah? To make it a great experience, to think about new things. And um, also we tried to embed impact, I think, into new features. So for example, every time you buy a coffee yeah, with our tomorrow card, we can show you in real time what the CO2 footprint of your of your purchase was, yeah? And um, so we run some analytics in the background together with a third party and show this to you. So how many kilograms of CO2 that that very purchase costs? Or you can also play around and see if if I, um, you know, buy at the grocery store, you can choose whether you're a vegan, you're a meat, lo you love meat, or you're a vegetarian, and you can see what, is, what, what impact difference does it make? So again, here, you know, we're trying maybe to influence also the behavior um, of, of customers. And I think it's very, very important that when you talk about impact, that you embed impact into your core product. So how, we, how did we do that? So what are the impact angles that we do? So on the top left, you see customer deposits. So typically banks, they use every euro that sits on your bank account and they invest it, right? Or they give out loans. And we said those customer deposits, we wanna make sure they're not used for fossil energy. They're not used for weapons, et cetera. They, if they are being used, then they are used for renewable energies or sustainable transportation, health, or whatever has a positive impact, right? So that's one area. The other on the bottom right, it's um, how, how, we, how we call it um, there, it's, it's basically this climate protection with every payment. So we said, every time you buy with your to uh, something with a tomorrow card, we use the so-called interchange fee that usually banks get from the merchants, and we donate it or we invest it in climate protection projects yeah? every time you pay. Or we also then thought, why not give users the option to round up to the next euro, use a round up, yeah? you can enable, disable in the app. And then automatically, you know, when you spend, let's say three euros 60, then it rounds up to four euros, you use the 40 cents and we donate uh, that money, for example, for climate justice um, projects. So really embedding, embedding it, you know, in a convenient way that it feels really convenient for a user. I think that made for us a huge, huge difference because people at the end of the day, they are lazy, right? And they want, they don't want to do that extra effort. And so making it 
convenient. So convenience, I think, is, is the one thing that unlocks a lot. And on the top right, we are at the moment rethinking, saving and investing. Yeah, of how are we going to make it easier for people to automatically save for their retirement, save for a rainy day um, and also invest. And that always in a sustainable way without harming um, the planet. Um, and so for us, I don't gonna, I'm not going to dive too much into detail how we do the screening, because I think today we have a different focus. But of course, when you talk about sustainability, it's very important that you have a process, at least for us, on how do we define that. So we have a huge catalog of positive criteria. What are areas that we believe create positive impact, such as renewable energy, sustainable mobility, education, etc. And a list of exclusive uh, criteria, no child labor, um, etc. Uh, no fossil fuels, no weapons, um, no corruption, right? So you have exclusion, you have positive screening, and then we check it, how does it perform with this Paris Agreement, the 1.5 degree goal? And then um, at the end, we have a final approval that we, where we have an independent impact council who looks at every investment that we want to make. And so we as founders don't have a say in that. They are independent and they say, yes, your analysis was right. We, we approve it. And now you invest. Also, so really be consistent in that approach. Another aspect, I think, if we're talking about zebras, is we, we call it it's one of our core values. Transparency is queen and king. Yeah. I mean, anyways, if you're hiding stuff nowadays, it's going to come out one day, right? <laughs> Sooner or later, we all know that. So why not be transparent from day one? And we made that a, a crucial component of our app. So we can see this is a screenshot of our app in the bottom right. We have a button. This called is uh, is called impact. And here we show in our impact board in real time how much money is on our overall accounts, how much we have invested, in which projects have we invested. If you have enabled roundups, sorry, this is a screenshot, unfortunately, it's in German. Um, so, but if you have roundups um, enabled, how much you know, have you contributed individually? How much has the whole community contributed? So really showing everything in real time. And, and we have done the same thing with our product roadmap. So we are showing our product roadmap to the public yeah? and, and the public can vote yeah, up and down on, on certain features and we show what are we working on today, what are we working on tomorrow and what are we working on the day after tomorrow. I know when we talk about roadmaps, timing is always a problem right? on roadmaps. That's why we just kept it simple with today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. Okay, not to give... I think wrong indications about um, timelines when we talk about longer term um, um, roadmaps. The next thing when we talk about zebras and a new journey towards a more impact is governance. Governance is a weird word. Yeah? I don't know how many have heard it um, um, before, but governance is basically about the question, how do you control and how do you manage a company? How do you control the decision-making within a company? Yeah? And this is very crucial. So with, with tomorrow, we decided to be B Corporation certified. So there is a B Corp label. And I can only recommend anyone, if you're interested in impact, you know, um, route, get B Corp certified because um, basically they give you a really good framework on what you need to analyze in order to become a more sustainable company. And one of the things that they ask you to do is to incorporate into your articles of association or in your shareholder agreement that you as a company commit not only to serve your shareholders, eh? because this is the old economy, right? Serving the shareholders. But you commit in that articles of association or shareholder agreement that you take into consideration other stakeholders. Eh? And other stakeholders means it can be your employees, it can be your suppliers, it's the environment, it's your neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. And so we went down that route and I think we got also certified best for the world um, B Corp um, in the last two years. <clears throat> so if you're interested in getting to know more about um, B Corps, et cetera, and the way to get there, um, um, you can talk to us any anytime. We're, we're happy um, to share best practices, et cetera. And the next, next thing, Within, within um, governance, we decided to form a so-called impact council. So a council 
that monitors our impact strategy, that monitors our impact behavior. And so we have various people from various backgrounds, from the social background, from, um, you know, we have a professor for sustainable, uh, <clears throat> uh, for social entrepreneurship, um, people from the social sector, etc., and they advise us. <clears throat> and they also have a seat in our advisory board, yeah? but I come to that in a moment. A seat at the table is very, very important for different stakeholders. And when I talk about seat at the table, <clears throat> I'm talking about your board. Yeah? Typically, every company has a board. Yeah? Typically, who sits in that board? Typically, <laughs> men, <laughs> right? Um, and typically, founders, typically investors. That's it, full stop. Yeah? And I believe it's very important that you open up boards, yeah? that you open up the board and you give people, other than the investors, a seat at the table. And we, for example, decided that we gave away one seat to a representative of our employees. Yeah, We have a seat at the table. <laughs> and we gave one seat to our impact council. So we have one representative from the impact council who sits at our board. Huh? And by this, we really try to diversify um, the board and you have different stakeholders, different interest groups, and they will make sure you, you don't divert you know, um, away from the impact strategy. Another thing that we have done is we have involved our own community, our user community that helped us build our product and made them investors. Yeah. So we raised in our first crowd invest um, 3 million euros in 300 minutes. Uh, last year, we even raised 8 million euros in 24 hours and made them, you know, um, part, <laughs> part of the share, almost you can call it shareholders. Yeah? So participating from the financial benefits of the, of the company. And then <clears throat> I think since I talked already about employees, yeah. Um, now nowadays we we are a team of um, hundred and and twenty people, and on this impact journey, I think it's so important. Uh, basically, if you want to attract the best talent, yeah? we are all in war for talents these days, right? If you have an impact mission, if you have an impact strategy, this makes a huge difference to attract top talent, because top talent nowadays. They, 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 they search for impactful uh, companies. I mean, we get a lot of um, 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 basically uh, people who apply um, to us because they don't want to work in their field anymore because they don't feel any sense anymore. Yeah? And um, I think increasingly they're asking their potential employer, what are you doing for the climate? Huh? And I think this really, um, if you go down the zebra route, you will get better talent. I can assure you, and with this talent, you need the talent to build the best products out there. Next point is, I, th I think, measure and report what you achieve. Yeah? So sustainability reporting, for example, I think is very, very important. Yeah? And start very, very, very simple. You can start with your CO2 balance, just measuring it yeah? and then trying to improve it year after year. And we try to do the same. I, I'm not going to dive into the numbers here. I just wanted to show you how we internally report, report those numbers. And it's important to report them, improve on, on them, show them, share them. And <clears throat> I think the question is, where do you start this impact journey? Yeah. So this looks like a very complicated graph here, but I, I just wanted to, because this is a graph we use internally to rate our different impact drivers. And I think what I would like to give you here is, first of all, to differentiate between what impact do you want to achieve or are you achieving at the moment within, within your organization? Yeah? What are you doing for your people, et cetera, for your suppliers um, and your company DNA? And on the left side, what is your product delivering on impact? Yeah, so that's, that's the two things here. And then... I differentiate here between doing better and avoiding bad, yeah? because typically it's more easy to start with avoiding bad. Yeah? And for example, if you look at the at the bottom right, offsetting is something like this. Yeah, so you have a CO2 footprint as a company, you offset it, so you're avoiding bad. You're not really doing something good, but you're avoiding bad or energy efficiency, yeah? or 
diversity um, and, and belonging, for example, inclusion, inclusion and belonging. Yeah, I think it's, it's really avoiding bad. Then corporate volunteering as an organization, you're really creating some positive impact because you're actively helping some other organizations out there. And on a product perspective, for example, um, you know, the footprint feature that I showed you, yeah, this is basically maybe avoiding bad because you're helping people to avoid negative emissions. And the rounding up feature, for example, that's on the top left, we are really actively collecting donations that we then directly give out to great organizations in the world who create new projects, building new, uh, let's say, for example, photovoltaic infrastructure or planting trees or whatever, whatever it is, but really creating additional impact here. Yeah? And this is what, I, what we call doing better. And I think you can really look at your organization, your product, and start somewhere. Yeah, and it's totally okay to start with avoiding bad and then try to move up. And the orange circle things are things that we are looking at at the moment. Yeah? So what are new things that we would like to bring to the table? So I don't want to deep dive here because we don't have so much, so much time today. And yeah, with this, I would really, really like, um, I think, to close um, yeah, um, this, 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 this short presentation and really encourage you yeah, um, maybe to start within your organization to become more like a zebra and start uh, your impact journey. And I think products are a great leverage, especially digital products, to scale impact. So let's go out there and create impact. Thank you very much. Ines, wonderful. Thank you so much for the truly inspiring talk. And uh, I have to say, I love the zebra concept. Um, I usually love to just wear colorful clothes, but I might just go to black and white to live it and remind myself of this concept every day. Um, there were so many great and strong points. And then I love how you're really embedding the positive impact in the whole organization. It's not a department that has a budget that does a few things on the side it's really like woven into into the fabric and um, I think that's an amazing kickoff for our day to day where we're talking about scaling and embedding customer experience uh, while at the same time doing good so thank you for this great talk there are um, uh, a few questions uh, in the chat that that have come up and um, if you if you uh, allow I will read the first one yes please which is what were the hardest situations in creating a sustainable company? And what advice would you um, give those who want to take this path? The hardest thing for me personally was at the very beginning when we started out in 2016, 2017 was that when we talked to investors, investors said, we do, yeah, sustainability is nice, but it's a niche phenomenon. They don't believe it's gonna become a big topic. Luckily, this has changed. Yeah? Now, <laughs> I think everyone understands it's also a big business opportunity, right? <laughs> and you need to become Im impactful as an organization and it goes hand in hand, I think, with your company's success. So I would say this, this was one of the hardest things. Now it has become easier. The second thing I would say is sometimes you have to really accept compromises because um, sometimes things take longer if you want to do them in an impactful way that's the price that you have to pay but it pays off um for example when we looked for a banking um supplier that you know helped us with our core banking infrastructure it was so hard to find someone who, who was aligned with our values but we didn't give up we found the right one it took a little bit longer but it pays off so you know sometimes maybe having a little bit more more, uh, more patience and um maybe as a follow-up question Ines. How do you how do you know where to compromise? Um, I, I like the story that you said. It's like don't give up and, and keep looking for the right provider, uh, but at the same time you said sometimes you do need to compromise. How do you draw that? Uh, how do you find that right balance? Yeah, you, <clears throat> I think you can only um, do it through a dialogue. Yeah, and, and and for example, sometimes we have this dialogue with our impact council. Yeah, because they're not they're not biased huh? because as a business owner, you're always biased. Yeah? And, and, and the, the impact council typically is not biased. So, you know, having a, a certain board or a group of people talking it through with your employees. Yeah. I think they, they know very, very, uh, very well. And um, they, um, I think elaborating it together with them and concluding 
I think the right the right path is yeah, through a dialogue. I would say is always the best. Yeah. Yeah. So dialogue is key. And um, maybe as a follow up question as well, you said it was really hard to convince your investors uh, initially. Um, how did you persuade them? Was dialogue also a key uh, part of that? And um, yeah, how did you nudge them along? I'm also thinking about everyone who's now sitting uh, on their screens yeah. thinking, oh my God, I'm so inspired. I have to go out <laughs> and, and uh, transform my organization. How can they do that? Yeah, finally, I think that the thing that worked best is actually building a really, really good product and then make them use the product. Yeah? This helped us so much. I found so many investors who by coincidence were a customer or became a customer or their children became customers of tomorrow. And, and they, they typically became fans. Yeah. And then they convinced sometimes their parents you need to invest in tomorrow. And then they invest, you know, it, it so really by, by the product, I would say, um, and then not giving up, yeah, searching for the right people. And there's so many people out there, um, you know, having money and you have to search and you have to work hard and it's hard to work at the same time. I, I love that story of, of, uh, of uh, yeah, getting, uh, finding the, the champions um, who then convince the parents because there there is a, a generational difference in, in some ways. Uh, and yeah. And those champions then also go on and, and, and are the positive word of mouth. I see Toby popping up again. Um, that's probably my sign to say thank you so much, Inas. It was a truly inspiring talk. Um, and I, I think um, you, you're still around for a few minutes. So if people have uh, any sure. questions, they can put them into the chat or into the into to the Q and A, and um, you'll be around to, to an answer a few. And uh, we'll be now splitting literally um saying saying goodbye to, and a very big thank you to Ines and uh, we now you. start our two two tracks thank you Ines <laughs>